Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Simo Zenios, and I am the Associate Director of the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. I am delighted to welcome everyone to today's event, a lecture by and a discussion with Professor Johanna Hanning on her recent translation of Andreas Karkavitsas's The Archaeologist, which came out at the end of last year by Penguin Press. The event, our first virtual lecture for the new academic year, is offered in celebration of International Translation Day. We are delighted to co-host this event with the Embassy of Greece in the United States, the Department of Classics at UCLA, and the Los Angeles chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America. It is an honor to partner with these institutions. I want to thank and acknowledge Her Excellency, Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou, Professor Alex Purvis, Chair of the Classics Department, and Professor Kenneth Seligson and Mr. Charlie Steinmetz, President and Vice President, respectively, of the Los Angeles Chapter of the Archaeological Institute. I would also like to thank my colleague, Professor Sarah Morris from the Department of Classics and the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA, who has graciously accepted our invitation to join the discussion with our speaker. Before turning the program to our speaker, I would like to welcome the ambassador of Greece and a friend of the center, Alexandra Papadopoulou, who will offer introductory remarks. Your Excellency, the screen is yours. Thank you, Dr. Zenius, for your kind introduction. It is indeed a pleasure to work with you again. And I look forward to another fruitful season of collaboration between the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture and the Embassy of Greece in Washington. Today, we're celebrating International Translation Day, which indeed was yesterday, September 30th, and was designated by the United Nations in 2017 as a day of tribute to the work of tireless translators and language professionals around the world. This is a well-deserved recognition, as translation makes the world go around. The art of translation fosters understanding a camaraderie between nations and individuals, while it facilitates the movement of ideas. A world without translation and translators is unimaginable. Truly, translation and translators are an indispensable part of our society with a critical role in creating understanding and bringing nations together and making international public discourse possible. Translation bridges gaps not only between nations and individuals, but also between eras, as it is through translation that we know of the past, not only our own, but of nations around the world, helping create mutual respect in an ever-evolving world. One might easily say that translation even plays a significant role in fostering peace and understanding among nations. The very existence of world literature, among other sectors, stands upon translation, as it helps preserve literature, such as the classics and masterpieces that can be enjoyed by people around the world. The great Greek poet of the 20th century, Kostis Palamas, remarked that without translation, we would be confined within the limits of a single country, a single language, a single perspective. The translator is our ally, and translation makes possible our interaction with the world. From the translation of ancient Greek works to Latin and Arabic, as well as in Romance languages during the Renaissance, to the translation of key works in modern philosophy and science during the Greek Enlightenment, to the translation of masterpieces of Greek literature in the 20th century in several major languages, Translation has proven to be something more than the act of disseminating text and information across linguistic borders. We can even say that the very formation of Hellenic identity, both within Greece and beyond, is inconceivable without translation and the fertile contact between languages and cultures. This is something that I have experienced countless times in my diplomatic career. Therefore, in celebrating International Translation Day, we celebrate not only Greek letters and their global influence, but also the open and reflective character that every identity entails. 
Andreska Kravitsa's archaeologist, splendidly translated by Dr. Johanna Hanning, which we will hear about today, can be read as an allegory that warns against the adoption of narrow and limiting perspectives on who we are and who we might be. In other words, it can be read as an allegory for the importance of translation understood in its most encompassing sense. We are fortunate that we have with us today the amazing translator of the work, Professor Johanna Hanning, an important scholar in her own right, to introduce us to this major work of Greek letters and to her own work as translator. Thank you, Dr. Hanning, for helping us celebrate this tribute and share with us your exquisite translation of the work of Karkavitsas, a difficult feat indeed. We are truly looking forward to your presentation and discussion. Thank you again, Dr. Zenius, and of course, Dr. Sharon Kerstel, for your continuing and productive collaboration with us. Here is to the new and rewarding season of events. Thank you, Your Excellency, for this very thoughtful, this very inspiring and wonderful remarks. Before I introduce our speaker, some housekeeping okay. details. Following the lecture, Professor Sarah Morris will offer a brief response and reflection on Karkavitsas' novel. Please keep your microphones muted for the duration of these first two parts of the event. So after Professor, Professor Morris's uh, reflection, we will open the screen for a Q&A session. You can ask questions at that time, either by typing them in the chat or by using the raise the hand icon, which can be found under the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. Now on to the event of the day. It is truly an honor and a joy to introduce today's speaker, Professor Johanna Hanning. Professor Hanning is a scholar of ancient and modern Greek at Brown University. She received her PhD in classics from the University of Cambridge. Her work in classics focuses on classical Athens, particularly on the cultural life of the city's fourth century BCE. She's especially interested in the construction and reception of the idea of the ancient Greek miracle. Some of her work touches on the points of contact between modern politics and ideas about ancient Greece and antiquity more generally. She's the author of the classical debt, Greek antiquity in an era of austerity, which came out by Harvard University Press in 2017, and of the Lycurgan Athens and the making of classical tragedy, which came out by Cambridge University Press in 2014. As is very pertinent to today's event, she's also the translator, the, the translator of both ancient and modern, uh, and modern Greek works. In addition to the work we will be discussing today, she has published a short volume of speeches from Thucydides entitled, How to Think About War, an Ancient Guide to Foreign Policy, which came out by Princeton University Press in 2019. She's active in Brown's program in Modern Greek Studies and is the Arts and Humanities Editor of the Journal of Modern Greek Studies. The title of her talk today is Bones, Stones, Trees and Roots on the Enduring Urgency of Karkavitsa's Archaeologist. Uh, Professor Hani, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Zenyosai, for that very warm introduction and for the, the wonderful invitation. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here today with such an international audience. I think we're spread across so many time zones. It's only fitting for, for International Translation Day, which happens to fall on September 30th, the, the feast day of one of my personal favorite saints, St. Saint Jerome. So and that's why that's on that day. Um, I, I want to also um, extend my thanks to Professor Sharon Gerstel um, and also to Professor Sarah Morris. Thank you so much, Sarah, for agreeing to, to engage in this conversation today. And really heartfelt thanks to the ambassador to ambassador a couple of blue for words that really were very, very touching to me. I really, really appreciate the very warm introduction. So if you'll forgive me a, a brief what I hope will be a brief moment of awkwardness. I do want to share my screen. Um, I have just a few slides. Um, and I assume that this share is working or else um, Seema would make some sort of 
gesture at me. So what I want to do today is really introduce, as, the, as Her Excellency the Ambassador said, just to introduce this work. This is a work that I worked on. It really became a labor of love and of a certain kind of solitude during the pandemic. I, I did a, a great deal of it during the most austere part of the lockdown. And so this is a, this is a scholarly project that also became uh, perhaps more of a personal project than I was used to, a personal project in, in somewhat of a different way than I was used to. So it is one that remains very close to my heart. And I, I would just like to talk a little bit about its author, Andreas Karkavitsas. Um, I'll, I'll note that in November, there is actually gonna be a conference in his birthplace in Lejena um, to honor the 100th anniversary of his, his death, uh, which was in 1922. Um, but um, so I want to just introduce the author. I want to say a little bit about the work and why I think it has not only urgency, but perhaps a renewed urgency today, why it has, um, in a way, I think it was a work that was really truly ahead of its time. Uh, some of the allegorical contours of the piece might in some ways seem a bit banal or, or kind of over the top or facile today, but I think that actually this work really brings out some of the tensions that have um, occupied scholars of modern Greek studies and of archaeology, which has had a kind of inward self-reflexive, self-reflective turn in the last decade or two. Um, so I think that I just wanted to kind of lay out some points of, of interest in this work. And then I wanted to share with this, this audience um, uh, a few things that I've been thinking about um, in terms of the recurrent image of of trees that I find really fascinating throughout this, this novella, and which I'll be speaking about more at the upcoming Modern Greek Studies Symposium, Modern Greek Studies Association Symposium in Toronto later this month. Um, but that will also be an excuse for me to share a couple of the passages that I, that I translated for the novella with you. And I've, I've clustered those around the theme of trees. So let me begin by saying a bit about this, this very beloved author, um, Andreas Karkavitsas, who was born in 1865, and as I just mentioned, who died in, in 1922, um, 100 years ago this year, actually 120, 100 years ago this autumn. With all due respect, I, I would venture that today, Karkavitsas is not particularly well known outside of Greece, even though he really is one of the most significant authors in the history of modern Greek literature and in that kind of literary history trajectory. During his lifetime, he published three novels or novellas, um, The Fair Maid, which is Roderick Beaton's translation of the title Ligeri in 1890, The Beggar, Zitianos, in 1896, and then The Archaeologist, which he wrote in 1903, which, which was published in 1904. So he also published some 80 short stories, um, some poems, accounts of travels at sea and within rural Greece. Those, uh, those essays are ones I particularly love. Essays about history, culture, language, and politics, and readers for use in primary schools, so collections of texts for, for children. He's actually often described as having worked in every literary genre except for playwriting. His life and literary career spanned truly formative and turbulent decades in the history of the Greek state which of course, as you all know, had declared independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1821, and whose autonomy had been formally recognized by the European great powers with the Treaty of Constantinople in 1832. Karkavitsas was born again in 1865 in Lehena, a town on the northwestern coast of the Peloponnese in the region of Elis in Western Greece. He would die later in Marusi in Athens or the suburb of Athens on October 10th, 1922, just a day before the decisive Greek defeat in the Greco-Turkish War was made official with the armistice of Mudania. That conflict, which of course is remembered in Greek as the Asia Minor catastrophe, began when shortly after the conclusion of World War I, Greece invaded Ottoman territory in a bid to annex Ionia, the region on the western coast of the Anatolian peninsula of modern day Turkey. Karkavitsas did not live to witness the two greatest consequences of the catastrophe, namely one, the abolishment of the Ottoman Sultanate and the creation of the Republic of Turkey on November 1st, 1922, 
And number two, the sort of formalization, the formal recognition or ratification of the exchange of populations that was, that was concretized by the Treaty of Lausanne or the Greco-Turkish Exchange Convention on January 30th of 1923. So that fateful exchange, really a forceful displacement of 1.6 million people that took place over several years, saw the deportation of Muslims living in Greece to Turkey and Christians living in what became Turkey to Greece. I think that these dates are really interesting then because Karkavitsa seemed to, it seems that his death really was keyed up to a time that an extremely eventful chapter in his history, in his country's history was coming to a close and a new one was just beginning. So his death really kind of lines up with what I think that can be called the end of an era in, in, in Greece. So in terms of these kinds of landmarks, um, many of you will also know that we find ourselves this year um, coming to the end of a year that was a, a large landmark year. 1922 um, with the exchange of populations and there's been a lot of work around that topic and the sort of question of the, the refugee question 100 years on. Um, and then of course last year in 2021, that, had, that year had marked the bicentennial of the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence, that conflict that pitted the great powers against the Ottoman Empire and resulted of course in the birth of the Greek nation state. So I had really been insistent with Penguin, my publisher, um, and they, they were sort of very interested in this, uh, in this alignment that the book come out in time for the 2021 uh, bicentennial. That historical milestone was widely hailed both in Greece and abroad as an impetus for really intensive reflection on the past, present, and future of Greece. 2021 was an extremely busy year in terms of sort of intellectual work around, around Greek history and, and culture, identity, and literature. Conferences and ceremonies, events, special issues of journals, including my own, the Journal of Modern Greek Studies, and new book releases, really releases of wonderful, important new books, all marked the occasion. The international dialogue around the bicentennial was, perhaps moreover, although, Infused with particular urgency, I think, in light of the country's recent financial and humanitarian crises. Over the last decade, the Greek crisis had provoked particularly robust debate around Greek national identity, something that interested me very much and which prompted my, my book, The Classical Debt. Um, uh, so the questions about Greek national identity, especially in relation to Europe and these kind of rubrics of Western classicism, um, and also crypto-colonialism, which was a term that was coined by anthropologist Michael Hertzfeld, which I'll come back to. So in short, the, the bicentennial of last year, 2021, invited a historical perspective on questions that I think are still very pressing now one year on. And these are questions that are raised very presciently, again, I think ahead of his time in some ways a bit, by Krakowicz's novella, The Archaeologist. So questions like, where does Greece fit into the modern world? What role, if any, should its celebrated and famed antiquity play in the country's modern identity and what you might call its national brand? Um, another question I think is raised, but which is has to do with the fact that while Greece is a sovereign nation, nearly two centuries after gaining its political independence, that an idealized ancient past still remains uh, something that is a, a shadow that hangs very much over the country. Why is that the case? Are there ways that classical antiquities legacy can continue to be generative? Sort of what might change about the way that that um, tradition is, is received in the country today? Um, so this anniversary, let me just, uh, okay, um, so besides this anniversary, I thought would furnish a particularly opportune moment for the first English translation of Karkavitsis's The Archaeologist, uh, a novel that more than a century ago now grappled with and actually I think helped to articulate and frame these very kinds of questions, the questions that I just raised. So published in Athens in 1904, The Archaeologist is an allegory of Greek nationalism stylized in a way that I actually find quite charming as a folk tale. In bright and lucid prose infused with lively dialogue, bright, lucid, but also challenging prose, I'd say, it tells the story of Aristodemus and Dimitrakis Eumorphopoulos, 
two brothers and descendants of the illustrious Eumorphopolis line. And they're really a stand-in for the sort of an allegory for all of the, the Greeks. For centuries, this Eumorphopolis family has been persecuted by the Khan family, so the Ottoman Turks. But when the Khans begin, when their empire begins to topple, the Eumorphopolis brothers resolve to regain their family's ancestral lands and to restore their line's ancient glory. But of course, as you can imagine, whenever you have a story about two siblings like this, two brothers, the two are going to disagree and disagree they very much do about the best path forward for the family. Aristodemus insists, so he's the archeologist of the title, he insists to the point of absolute mania that the family should look to the past, to their ancient language, texts, religion, and monuments. Dimitrakis insists on this exuberant embrace of the present, of the here and now, or at least that's how he starts out the novella with this as a kind of uh, antithesis for his brother Aristodemus. So the story allegorizes, you might say, and among other things, what Patrick Lee Fermer once famously called the Heleno-Romaic dilemma. Um, according to Fermer's rubric, which I think is sort of oversimplifying, but I think is, is very much embodied by these two brothers, we have Hellenism and Romaism, Romaism presented as two contradictory yet complementary models of Greekness, with Hellenism looking to the classical past and being sharply inflected by European Romanticism. So again, the side represented by Aristodemus. And then Romaism as something more rooted in recent history, sort of the, the Byzantine and the Orthodox legacies. So put crudely, this is as presented by Firmer and I think also by Karkovitsas in the form of Dimitrakis. This is a version of Greek identity that's a little bit scrappier and more down to earth and of the moment, more cynical, but also playful. In Karkovitsas' novel then, Aristodemus is this picture of Hellenism taken to dangerous extremes, whereas Dimitrakis is again, the physical embodiment of a vigorous and impetuous Romaism. And in the end, Aristodemus' obsession with excavating the past in both literal metaphorical senses of that phrase is precisely what does him in. Um, I, I suppose it's very hard for me to talk about this novella without spoiling it. So I will say that the novel concludes on a scene in which an ancient statue that he has unearthed topples on top of him and crushes him to death. And that's that's the sort of last scene. So I, I hope that doesn't ruin much for, for people. Um, in the, the spirit of the day, do you wanna say a little bit about translation and Karkavitas, which I think there's a very interesting translation history around him. I am far from the first um, translator and far from the first English translator of this important, uh, of this very important author. Actually, works by Andreas Karkavitsas were translated into other languages, primarily German, French, and English during his own lifetime, which I think it's important to, to note this because it's, a, it's an indicator of the esteem that he gained outside of Greece already while he was still living. It did, however, take six years after his death for one of his three published novellas to become available in English. Uh, let me just switch sides. So I, it's really a pleasure to mention um, the translation of Krakowicz's second novel, The Beggar, which appeared in 1960. And this was um, this translation was published by William F. Wyatt Jr., who was actually a, a professor of classics at, at Brown. He retired shortly before I arrived, but I did have the pleasure of meeting him on one or two occasions. And so it was really, again, another way in which this project became a very personal one for me because it gives me a certain pleasure to think that Brown has become the center of Parkovitsis' studies perhaps over this, this long durée of many years with um, Professor Wyatt's translation appearing some 62 years ago now. But this translation was, and I think this is important to note, it was published under the aegis of UNESCO's Collection of Representative Works, a multi-decade initiative to support translations of world literary masterpieces. And as Her Excellency the Ambassador noted, the International Translation Day was also a UN UNESCO initiative. So there's a nice sort of um, rhyming of, of these, these data points here. The Beggar was inspired by Karkavisas' own extensive travels in rural Greece. It takes place in the region of Thessaly on the eve of the region's session to Greece by the Ottoman Empire. 
And this extremely powerful novella tells the story of the existential havoc that is wreaked when a professional beggar called Cirito Costas arrives in a village at the foot of Mount Olympus and begins preying upon the impoverished peasants, largely by exploiting their superstition and their, their sort of petty shortcomings. This work is widely regarded as a classic of modern Greek literature. It remains a standard text in Greek school curricula, but it is also the first novel to be published entirely, entirely in Demotic Greek. That's a very important point. On that last count alone, again, that this is the first novel to be published entirely in Demotic, it is itself of considerable literary historical importance. So I think this raises the question, though, why had the archaeologist not been translated into English? Uh, in his definitive introduction to Greek literature, which appeared with Oxford University Press in 1994, Professor Roderick Beaton wrote that, quote, the archaeologist takes to its logical and unsustainable conclusion the underlying impetus of the whole movement in Greek fiction of the late 19th century. So again, quote, namely to draw on the resources of indigenous folklore in order to buttress an emerging national identity and establish a literary tradition unambiguously linked to that identity. I'm interested here, and I have been interested in, in Professor Beaton's note that this is a that this novel takes all of this, 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 this impetus to an unsustainable conclusion, that there is something sort of over the top about this novella. And I would say that. It's interesting to, to pursue the, the critical tradition around the novella because when the archaeologist first appeared in 1904, critics, including Karkavitsos' own friend Xenopoulos, who was the early Athenian admirer of Kavafi, who really brought Kavafi to an elite Athenian reading public, these people largely regarded it as a literary and aesthetic failure. The, the novel was kind of a flop. The very high expectations set by Karkavitsas' previous two novels, so Iligeri, The Fair Maid, and Zitianos, The Beggar, only made critics' disappointment even greater. Critics found the allegory too transparent, um, too extreme, and they saw the heavy-handed political and cultural messages as coming at the expense of any real character depth or development. Some readers, on the other hand, were also displeased by what they mistook as Karkavitsis' advocacy for just a wholesale disavowal of Greek antiquity. Some people saw him as completely rejecting Greek antiquity, which is a superficial reading of the novella, I must say, because the ending is really a perfect kind of Hegelian synthesis moment of antiquity and modernity coming together to be something even greater. Um, in a February 1905 issue of Panathenia, Karkavitsas' friend, Soxenopoulos, a prominent critic and the magazine's editor, expressed approval of the book's content, but disappointment with its form. He lamented, quote, that the archaeologist has a far greater didactic rather than artistic value, and that it therefore, quote, does not belong to the great art to which this extraordinary story writer has accustomed us, end quote. Some, so, and so these are the kind of, some of the data points of the, the crit criticism and the critiques that Karkavitsas received. Um, so on the one hand, that the allegory was simply too transparent, um, and on the other, that Karkavitsas was rejecting antiquity. And these tended to come from different groups of people, but the, the total was a, a fairly, um, fairly negative reception of the work. Um, I just wanted to share briefly um, uh, an exchange with the editor of Estia um, that was reported the year after the novella came out. Adonis Kiru, the editor of, the, of that newspaper magazine, reported this. He said that Karkavitsas told him, many people have accused me of being an antiquity hater. Um, and he said with a laugh, because of this book. That means, quite simply, that those many people either haven't read it or they haven't understood it. That's Kiru's rejoinder. And Karkavitsis comes back and says, that's what I say too, because in the book, it's not antiquity that I'm denouncing, that would be insane, but rather this notion that we have about our obligations toward monuments of ancient art. Um, despite the negative reception, though, Karkavitsis stood by his work. In May of 1905, so a few months later, he wrote a letter um, with words to that effect to Carl Dieterich, the Byzantinist and Neo-Hellenist at the University of Munich, who had actually proven a, a, a friend and uh, admirer of Karkavitsis' earlier works. 
since I have this uh, a quotation from that letter on the slide. The two had been in correspondence for several years, and again, Dietrich had conveyed some points of criticism in a letter to Karkavitsas over this, this latest production. But in his response, Karkavitsas nevertheless insists that, quote, the archaeologist, with all the flaws that you and others here in Greece find in it, is out of all of my works, the one that I like best. And he explains his attachment to this work by insisting that, quote, it says something to my ridiculed people, and there the word for people is ethnos, in, in an attempt to put them on the path of truth, the path of God. Over here, so in Greece, and I believe you know this, it is not yet time for carefree song. We also need to instruct. And I think Professor Morris will have a few words to say on this point about instruction um, when, she, when she takes over. So Karkovitsas lived for another 18 years after the publication of The Archaeologist, but he never came out with another novel. He never finished another novel. And even his output of short stories, which had been extremely prolific even during his career as a doctor, um, primarily for the military, um, his, that, that, that sort of aspect of his creative output really slowed to a trickle as he, as he grew older. Instead, he devoted the majority of his creative energies to writing very short patriotic texts in demotic Greek and to curating readers that were used um, in primary schools. So in other, effort, in other words, to efforts to instruct exactly what he had said that the archeologist as a novella had been meant to do. I think though that these criticisms, this critique of Karkavitsas' work when it first came out now are in some ways precisely the aspects of the novella Right, that endow the work with its historical significance. These again were the things that most displeased the elite Athenian literary circles, but which are now are really great historical, I think anthropological, cultural, historical significance for us as modern readers. Um, Greek speaking scholars in particular, and especially historians of Greece's national archeological institutions are, have had been increasingly citing this work as a key witness to histories of archeology span and classicism and debates about their entanglements with the Greek nation state. As these scholars have pointed out, the archeologist is a testament to Greece's historically fraught status in relation to Western colonial powers. Um, so I think that this is important. I mean, I have been seeing the archeologist cited in works of scholarship that had appeared in English, but there was no English translation available. So let me just say a little bit more about how some of these scholars have been using this work. I mean, on the one hand, the seeds of Greece's enduring status of, you know, this, this hurts filled the notion of the crypto colony of Europe were already sown by the high interest loans that the European powers had issued to the Greek revolutionaries during the War of Independence, the so-called independence loans. On the other, on the other hand, people and polities outside of Greece, so France, Britain, Germany, US, have long since claimed Greek antiquity in different ways as their own intellectual and spiritual heritage, and therefore have seen its material antiquities, um, its statues, inscriptions, and pottery, et cetera, as their own rightful possession. And tonight I happen to be speaking to you just a few blocks from the British Museum. The Western academic disciplines of classics and archeology span both continue to be beset, I personally believe, by a colonial attitude towards an imagined ancient Greece and to regard Greeks themselves as objects of study rather than as to agents of knowledge production. This is, a, this is a point that I have made several times and that colleagues have made several times. So thus for an international readership, the archeologist offers a perspective on the classical legacy of the sort that has rarely crossed the language barrier from modern Greek into English. And again, the importance of translation here. That legacy is one which Greek revolutionaries regularly invoked as they appealed to Europe and to the US and for support in their bid for independence. And it continues to cast a long shadow today. And yet the archeologist also speaks to broader questions that bear on communities and countries far beyond Greece. So further questions I think it raises. How should ideas of the distant past matter to individuals, to families, peoples, and nations today? What does it mean? And what toll does it take to be constantly burdened with the task of living up to someone else's expectations of who you are and who you really ought to be? Sigmund Freud famously called psychoanalysis archaeology of the soul. And in the case of this novel, 
the actual dirt and trowel archaeology, so to say nothing of Aristodemus's dirt and dynamite, is also a psychologically freighted affair. This sort of the, the actual archaeological excavation that Aristodemus comes out is deeply in sort of entangled with his, his psyche, and you could even say his psychoses. Just before Aristodemus destroys an old plane tree on his land, and I'll say more about the plane tree in just a moment, he asks, quote, who knows what treasures its roots are concealing, end quote. And it's clear, I think, that the treasures he seeks from below the earth are far more than material objects. They are the answers to the riddle of his identity and proof of his and his people's birth. So this is a, just a sort of general overview. I think the, the work, the author, its significance. Um, I, I want to just say a little bit about this, this idea of trees in the novella, which is something that is now occupying me in a, in a sort of more, in a using the kind of scholarly or wearing my scholarly hat as opposed to sort of strictly translational translator's hat. Um, I became really fascinated by the use of trees and tree imagery in this novella. They appear so many times and they really stand in contrast with the, the stones and the bones of my title with the actual relics and artifacts, the, the hard, um, durable artifacts that Aristodemus is so obsessed with digging up. And we used for the, um, I think some of the events promotional material, this image from the great excavations at Delphi at the end of the 19th century, where you have Greek workmen around a, uh, a Kuro statue. And this scene really evokes for me uh, uh, the discovery of the, the, the ill-fated statue or the statue that becomes weaponized against Aristodemus up in the very last scene of the novella. Um, but trees, trees appear in really very many places um, as a contrast to, again, this kind of hard stone and bone materiality. And I just want to use the concept of trees as a way to share a few passages with you, um, with you here. So I want to begin with a passage in which um, the, uh, the novel opens on a scene where there are three philologists, three scholars. I translate as scholars this word Sophie, um, these wise men who have come to speak with the more fam populous family and to consult the family's books. Um, and there's a wonderful vivid account of how they read the family's books, which are really then this kind of stand in for all of the great texts of Greek antiquity. Um, so this is the scene that Karkavitha sets and it will end with the passage that I have here highlighted for you about trees. So the three professors hunched now over their manuscripts are reading insatiably as if imbibing the immortal water. With their little pencils, they jot down on paper anything that seems worth noting. Behind them, the bookshelves stand upright like prisoners chained to the walls with hands behind their backs. The house cat sits atop the middle one like a sphinx, sunk in her secret dream. Crammed there on the shelves, the books and manuscripts look like chatty old women. And just what don't they say with those speechless tongues of theirs? They tell of wars, they bear witness to great feats, they demolish gods and construct new morals from the pieces. Rhythm rumbles and frolics like a rebel roll of thunder. Harmony bubbles forth like a little fountain. Pain howls and desire debauches. The human spirit stretches forth like a sea babbling endlessly, restless and unruly. It ventures whatever it wants and it masters whatever it ventures. There is no iron door it cannot open, no tower wall it cannot clear. There is no light in the sky it cannot grasp. No darkness on land it cannot explain. It elaborates the past, confutes the present, and clears paths for the future. But are its elaborations sound, its paths reliable? Can we be so certain that those who have come um, and those yet to come thought, acted, and lived in just such a way, and in that same way will live, act, and think once more? Who can know? Will the enviable tree that sprang up from virgin soil by its own will and which beautified the world with its shade and elegance, shoot up again with the gardener's care. The scholars believe it is so, and that is why they labor tirelessly. So here you have the tree image as something that is not completely immortal in ways that stone and bone are presented, but something that does transcend the limits of a single human lifetime very, by really quite a bit. Um, which comes to stand in for the, the Hellenic tradition, more broadly speaking. And this is a really the first introduction of, I think, what becomes a very, very powerful metaphor 
throughout the work. Um, we then see a, a real long engagement with trees in, in the third chapter of the novella, which is really remarkable for its twin representations of great trees that have been felled. The chapter begins with an account of Osman's dream, um, the, the famous dream which uh, heralded the beginning or inspired the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. And that dream becomes recast as a nightmare that the antagonist Khan um, experiences in his palace. So again, Osman I, the founder of the Ottoman Empire, had dreamed of a tree that, quote, like sky, canopied plains and seas, cities and villages, mountains and rivers. Um, that's how it's recounted in, in this book. And it was a tree that represented universal empire. Khan, on the other hand, dreams of a storm that batters the tree and of a villager who suddenly appears and begins sawing it down from its roots. So um, we have then in also later in the same chapter, a really vivid account in the, in the, that's presented in the form of, a, if, you, if you're familiar with ancient Greek tragedy of a messenger speech, where we hear about the, the death in a way, the, the felling of a plane tree on the Eumorphopolis property. Um, in that case, the, the felling of the tree is no dream. Uh, it happens, it actually happens, but it's still freighted with immense symbolism. And I became really interested as a classicist in the presence of a plane tree in particular, the Platanos, because in the Greek literary tradition, ever since Plato's Socratic dialogue, Phaedrus, really, the, the plane tree has been used as a device in Greek literature to signify a sort of shady natural gathering spot that invites pleasant conversation and philosophical conversation in particular. And plane trees, I'm sure everybody in this audience knows, are famously long lived. And in so many villages and towns in, in, in Greece, they serve as anchors of village life, right? They're regular fixtures and squares, and so many tavernos are called platanos. So in the case of this novella, by so violently destroying a majestic old plane tree in the name of archaeology, Aristodemus in effect destroys an ancient symbol of intellectual tradition and continuity, human continuity, as well as the living link, truly living link with the illustrious ancient past that he's seeking. And it's a link that's presented as more authentic and more potent than any shard of bone or stone that lies in the dirts concealed supposedly by the roots of the plane tree. But um, the plane tree also though has significance, I think, in it's just simple status as a tree, one of the many works of nature that Aristodemus destroys in his quest to unearth the past. And this is something that I'm very interested in lately, and we'll be talking about the MGSA symposium, that I think that there's an interesting environmentalist critique of archaeological excavation that runs through this work in which the hard, cold, and rocky dirt that's so prized by the archaeologist is repeatedly again contrasted with this like lush and lively landscape that's full of color and sound and fragrance in which Dimitrakis and uh, another important character, Elpiza, um, really feel most at, at home. So I wanted to share um, a little bit of, of that passage. And this is in which, uh, this is a passage in which um, the, a servant of, the, um, of Khan is describing how this plane tree was felled. And here you see people, this is just a random tourist photo of a plane tree, but you'll see the significance of it in just, in just a moment. So this is the, the servant or really the enslaved um, worker of the Khan who tells him as Khan is looking with a spy glass out the window at the excavations. So this man says to him, there's no explaining what happened down there today, master. I saw it and got all choked up. And you know me, master, I'm not the type to cry easily. But if your lordship had been there, he'd have done the same. Me, really, said Khan knitting his brow. What on earth happened? Do you remember the big tree near the old man's little hut? The plane tree, you mean? Yes, the plane tree so big, not even eight people could have made a ring around it. He wanted to uproot that too. His mother and brother were telling him, don't. Mrs. Panoria, so this is the mother of the two boys, begged him with tears in her eyes. How is it bothering you? She kept saying to him. How is it bothering you? Take pity on it. No, he said, said the archeologist. Who knows what treasures its roots are concealing? I'll demolish any plane tree and even the house if I have to. This one included, he said. Leave it, my son, in God's name, the old woman begged. It gives us shade in the summer. It blesses us with coolness. I do all my chores in its shade. Leave it, his brother, Dimitrakis, was also saying. It too has a history. 
It was here that our forefathers would stop on their way home from laboring for Khan. Many of our own were hanged from its branches. Some watered it with their blood, others nourished it with their tears. It's just as sacred as your rocks. No reaction. He didn't see his mother's tears, didn't heed his brother's words, but just looked right at the scholars, the Sophie. They stood there silently and nodded, get rid of it. And when he saw that no worker was lifting a hand, he seized the ax himself and hacked like mad at the plane tree. Thwack, thwack, thwack went the ax, but the plane tree held out mightily. Then one of the scholars approached him and said gently, you won't get anywhere with the ax for the plane, you'll need dynamite. No sooner said than done. Aristodemus seized a stick of dynamite, threw it into the crevice and lit it. My God, it was so terrible. The ancient plane let out a moan that froze my blood. The tree lurched and fell to the ground with such a loud boom, you'd have thought a mountain had collapsed. Right then, I saw Mrs. Panoria white as paper. I thought that she too would follow the old plane tree, but she held fast. You wretch, she screamed at her son with all of her heart. You're not human, you're a beast. Not even Khan would have done something like this to us. And she fled the property together with Dimitrakis. They've now even moved out of their house. They want nothing to do with Aristodemus. And so this, this figure of the mother, who I just became my absolute favorite character in the novella, she, again, spoil, I'm sorry to spoil, but she, she dies in the course of it. And in the next chapter or so, Aristodemus will see, will come home to an empty house and actually see her ghost appear kneeling at the, the what's left of the trunk of this plane tree mourning for it. And I think it's really she who represents the true spirit of Hellenic of Greek antiquity, whereas Aristodemus is this kind of corrupted version of it. And so her connection with this tree and the way that she herself, her spirit, her ghost mourns the tree is really, again, I think very allegorical for Karkavitas's vision of trees as a better way of connecting past, present, and future than the sort of durable bones and stones. So I'll just conclude with one last passage. And this is a famous passage, um, Professor Dimitris Planzos has, has quoted this in his, in his scholarly work, um, where um, we get a kind of, again, very clear articulation of the symbolism of the tree according to this paradigm. And this is a scene in the next chapter in which Alpida presents to Dimitrakis an embroidery that she has made, um, which depicts the, the history of um, sort of more recent history of the Eumorphopolis family of the Greeks. So really from the fall of Constantinople to the present day with all of these different heroes, including the sort of generation of 1821. And Dimitrakis is looking at this and he says, I never knew about any of these people. I, I, I never knew any of these stories. I only had heard about, you know, people like Demosthenes that, you know, I found to be great boars when I was young and that's why I rejected history. But these are real heroes and I'm fascinated, but I never, never knew about them. And Alpiza, who represents this kind of pure sort of village, you know, Romaism, she says, you've never heard of them because that's how Aristodemus wanted it. He seizes on the roots and the leaves of the tree, but the trunk he rejects. To him, it doesn't seem so enviable. And he's never once considered, the girl added angrily, he hasn't considered that the trunk is what joins the roots and the leaves. So again, here we have a real emphasis on the significance of the tree as a, a source of continuity. And I think that this, as we find ourselves at this particular juncture in the academy and culture where there's a, a sort of renewed interest in environmentalism, a big interest in trees in particular, um, that that kind of combined with everything that I was saying about the urgency of this particular work still today in the way that it was very prescient in its own time, I think it prevents us with so much material for looking back at this time period, looking back at the development of archeology, span understanding the discourse in a more subtle and appreciative way, and returning to really this, this wonderful, wonderful author with eyes that are, that are fresh. So I, I'll end there, I, I've talked long enough, and I'll just thank, thank everyone again. Thank you so much for coming, and, and thank you to my very gracious host for the invitation, and for the occasion, the opportunity to share this with you. I think I'll believe now I'll turn it over to Professor Sarah Morris. Yes, exactly. And thank you, Johanna, for this uh, amazing talk. Thank you. I think, can everyone hear me and see me? Um, <clears throat>
Thank you so much. Uh, Kalomina to everyone. Um, and uh, uh, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are, good afternoon. I'm very grateful for the chance to uh, participate in this, in this wonderful session. And I'm especially grateful to Johanna Honig for translating this volume. I am, in, to my shame, I did not know the author or the novel. I'm glad she mentioned The Beggar and the connection to Brown University. It's wonderful to see the tradition uh, bringing classicists into modern Greek uh, stay alive at, at Brown University. <clears throat> so as an archeologist and as a foreigner, I, I feel very deeply sort of implicated in the plot of this novel. Uh, and I'll just make a few comments from my perspective as, as in both of those roles. Um, it is a peculiar allegory um, and less successful, less popular than his novels, his earlier ones. Um, so that's why in discussing it with Simos and Johanna, I su suggested that if we see it as his, the first of his didactic works to which he dedicated the rest of his life, teaching materials for schools, for students, it sort of makes more sense. Um, perhaps than in treating it or criticizing it as a, some kind of inadequate novel. I'm really grateful to Johanna for providing so much commentary about the historical background, which you've gone on to emphasize as the ambassador has about the timing, um, not only 1922 at the time the novel was written, Northern Greece was not yet part of the Ottoman, uh, uh, part of the Republic of Greece. It was still part of the Ottoman empire. And it, it's, it's extremely helpful to have you pointing out with your notes in the text when a character or a speech or a sentiment expressed indicates um, a different ethnic, religious, and cultural identities that were still in dispute among themselves, um, not just against the Ottoman um, Empire. And that's something very important uh, as we realize that for Northern Greece, 1922 is much more important than 18. Um, 21, of course, and it's telling that in chapter three, the Turkish overlord, the, the Khan, rejoices to see all these different, his subject peoples arguing among themselves, because of course, that sort of delays the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, and you could say it's still going on today in the greater Aegean and Balkan region. But I wanted to, as I say, especially comment as an archaeologist um, and a foreigner, I'm in a way complicit in this as Joanna puts it, a very urgent struggle that's still going on today between, let's say, landowners, farmers, modern Greeks, and archaeologists, farmers, uh, star, <laughs> foreigners, and the pull of the past. After all, antiquities are protected by law since the foundation of the uh, modern republic. Uh, there's no love lost between landowners and archaeologists. Uh, Greek law can jeopardize a construction of a new home, cultivation of a fertile land. So this nature culture um, opposition between ancient stones and living trees is very much alive um, and vivid today. I also have to say that um, as one of the that I, I'm one of the foreign Sophie, Sophoi scholars who are sort of denigrated in a way in the book, um, and I was particularly struck by Aristodemus's, well, the disgust in the last chapter um, where he rejects the great book by the foreign scholars. Namas dixon ixeni to spitimas. Why should we have to rely on foreigners to tell us about our own home? Um, and as I say, these, these that that was a particularly struck me that phrase in the last. Um, in the last uh, chapter. And I should say reading it in Greek is, if you can uh, do that, it, it really brings out the demotic, very colloquial flavor of the novel, which, which had a great impact at the time for people who were used to reading um, and knowing only Katharevusa. And I compliment Johanna on how she tried to bring out some of the colloquialisms and slang to, see, to give the flavor of all of that with expressions like the one I just made. Um, and I do have to say that at the very end of the novel, Karkavitsas makes his own position clear in the tragedy that befalls the brother who is wedded to ancient stones rather than trees. Um, and of course, it echoes in, in modern poetry um, from Seferis's Mythistorima, Greece wounds me. 
um, and his vision, the poet's vision of the marble head in his arms, what do I do with it? I, I couldn't, it sort of gives you goosebumps to think about the connections between these two. Um, I, I was also uh, very grateful you included the other stories at the end of the translation and particular his account of a visit to Delphi, the village of, of Castri before it was removed and the, and the houses destroyed and the inhabitants relocated. Um, this is something that is, is still going on today. And it's a wonderful uh, passage uh, of insights into what a real living village is like and what the cost is when you put antiquities first and displace these people. And as I say, the timing is, is good because we have this uh, book, Grisaki, published by the American School of Classical Studies uh, recently that is called A Neighborhood Lost in Search of the Athenian Agora. So I couldn't agree more that the conflict is still urgent between preserving the past and empowering the present and the future. And my main question to her is about the last line in the novel, um, the very last line where um, after, as I say, spoiler alert, we do lose the life of several characters in the novel. Um, and after the death and burial of the archeologists, the last line, at least in the Greek edition I have says, and ke'emina niki kala, which I think is a brilliant translation. They lived happily ever after. Johanna captures the flavor of the fact that this is a fairy tale and an allegory and it ends with that expression. But at least in my edition, the line continues, ke imis edo kalitara. In other words, in the story, they lived happily ever after, but this is the better outcome for us. I don't know. And that of course doesn't come across in happily ever after. So that my main, my only question to this wonderful translation and commentary to the author is um, how we can capture or restore that last line and how you decided not to include it in, in an explicit translation. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for listening. I want to thank uh, Johanna for offering this. I mean, first of all, this amazing uh, lecture, this introduction to the work, but evidently for providing, for translating this book and offering a gift to every person who teaches Greek language and literature uh, abroad. We are now able to introduce Karkavitsas to our students. This is a wonderful gift. So thank you very much, uh, Johanna. I want to thank uh, Professor Sarah Morris for her illuminating uh, remarks and contextualizing of the work. And I want to thank our partners that made this event possible. And of course, I want to thank all of you who uh, took some minutes of your time to be here today and uh, join us and listen from uh, Johanna. Uh, before we go, if I may put uh, our event schedule on the chat here. So uh, we have many events that are coming up that, that may be of interest uh, to many of you. We have archaeology related events. One that is coming up is a lecture by Roger Michel, the executive director at the Institute for Digital Archaeology. And the lecture is titled Phidias Unbound, how robot-generated replicas could solve uh, the, Parthenon, uh, the Parthenon marbles quantary. And another event that might be of uh, special interest to, to everyone is the retrospective on, of Theodoros Angelopoulos film uh, that we are co-organizing together with the UCLA uh, TV and Film Archive. You can find dates for many of the screening at the link that is provided in the chat. Uh, we will stop here, the formal part of this discussion. I will stop the recording, but if you want to stay for a few minutes, I see that many people in the audience uh, are friends and acquaintances of Johanna. If you want to say an informal hello, uh, please uh, grab your cup of coffee or keep it at hand and stay for a bit more. Thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>